Lefer who? I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce that. That's fine. <laughs> okay, uh, Research Center for Demographic Science at Oxford. And lastly, we're joined by Sarah Patterson, who is a postdoctoral fellow at NIA and a university and the sorry, and at the University of Michigan Population Studies Center. Ooh, lots of words. Okay. <laughs> so I just want to say again, thank you all for joining me. Um, I'm going to share my screen and get started here. Just give me one second. Okay. Oh, not my email. Okay. All right. I'm going to present. Oh my gosh, I started at the wrong slide. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Okay, here we are. <laughs> um, so thank you all for joining today for a third time. I um, uh, just want to mention again, my name is Shannon Crane. I am a media and outreach coordinator for the Population Studies Center at Penn. And for the past several years, I've been managing social media for the um, PAA annual meeting, which is kind of why we're doing this today. Um, and we're going to be talking about Twitter for population science researchers. So I just wanted to give you all a brief overview of what today's webinar is going to consist of. I'm gonna do my presentation where we'll cover context, considerations, content, and some tips for better tweets. Then we're gonna move into our panel discussion with our lovely panelists. And lastly, we're gonna go into some audience Q&A. Feel free to submit questions throughout. Um, if you have any clarifying questions, let us like indicate so in the chat and I will try and answer them as we go along. And feel free to ask any questions during the panel discussion too. All right, so today we're gonna be focusing on Twitter, though there are other platforms where people are sharing research such as academia.edu, ResearchGate, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Facebook. I will add that Facebook is less so of a platform for public dissemination of um, published research, but more so I've seen a lot of academic communities create Facebook groups. Um, and a lot of conferences have sections that have Facebook groups um, where they share kind of updates on research and things that might be coming out. So that's just like a aside at Facebook point. Um, and, yeah, so today we'll be covering Twitter for the most part. All right. So I just wanted to give a brief overview of Twitter at a high level. So there are almost 200,000 or 200,000, 200 million daily active users on Twitter, 500 million tweets per day, um, which is a lot of content. And 22% of US adults use Twitter and 42% of those users are on a daily. And about 70% of Twitter users say that they use this social media platform to get their news, which you know has, has brought to light some questions, not all of which we're gonna address today. <laughs> but another important note to make about Twitter is that um, it really is a platform for influencers and not influencers that are similar to Instagram or TikTok, where you're doing a lot of buying and selling of material products. Um, but a lot of people are on Twitter to share thoughts and ideas and for commentary too. A little side humor there sometimes, but uh, many journalists also have Twitter and uh, have Twitter accounts and a lot of media actors are also on Twitter. So it just kind of gives you an overall kind of look at what we're, what the platform really consists of. Okay. <clears throat> so next I wanted to talk about, after we talk about, you know, the high level overview of Twitter, what it's the climate like for population researchers online. And first, what we see is a lot of sharing of experiences. Um, people are sharing their experiences about submitting articles, reviewing articles, and kind of like the day-to-day -day of academia. People are 
sharing um, their experiences about presenting. And um, I'm going to bring this up later in the presentation, but academic chatter is one hashtag where people really use that to kind of create and continue dialogue about academic experiences. Um, also, people are networking on Twitter. <laughs> so one thing that some of you may or may not not be familiar with uh, is that a lot of people in newer generations are making friends uh, and and actually creating relationships online, <laughs> which might seem a little scary, but um, in this context, it's actually more common than I think some might guess. Um, another second category of things or what the climate is like is dissemination. So I think what Twitter has done is allowed for a lot of researchers to share their blogs and op-eds, which um, are really interesting kind of content that I think is becoming more and more popular. I've seen more trainings for people that are scientists that are writing more op-eds and blogs and then um, published research also. So with alt metrics, People are able to share their research, have a publication, and then also track that back. So you can look at Twitter mentions of your publication. You can look at news mentions of your publication using alt metrics. And so this has kind of provided a really interesting tool. And if you look at their website, they have pretty in-depth guides about how to, um, excuse me, report on alt metrics whether it's for your tenure application or other things um, that you might have as a part of your academic structure. And lastly here, we see that people are connecting with the media. So this is kind of one point that I think I'm going to make throughout the presentation, but because journalists are, are so present on this platform, it really provides an opportunity for you to make those connections. And this also includes funders, policymakers, and stakeholders. And as you can see, I've, I've plugged one of our panelists here. So this is a tweet that um, Courtney Quote retweeted. Um, and they're just discussing uh, kind of the process of giving um, feedback and a review. And I think that this is the type of content that um, we don't always get to really see in our real lives and it doesn't always come up in conversations, especially surrounding review when you're in that room, when you're reading the article. And so I think Twitter really provides um, a place for people to share those experiences and give advice. So yeah, all right. Oh, I went too far. Oh, where am I? Sorry. <laughs> My mouse is slipping. Okay, so all that being said, the public may not understand exactly what demography and population science mean, let alone what you all do in your day to day. And yet, much of the research in population science and demography, and now more than ever population health, are intertwined with national discussions. And people are really interested in these, in these topics whether it relates to the 2020 census, health disparities in the COVID-19 pandemic, or overall population changes, your research is interconnected with these topics. And I think a really thoughtful example of this relationship is Leslie Root's op-ed in the Washington Post from 2019. So in 2019, there was a terrorist attack at a mosque in New Zealand and the shooter began his manifesto with, it's the birth rates. And to be clear, I'm not, nor was Leslie, inferring a causal relationship between the shooting and demographers' discussion of birth rates. But I think an important takeaway from this op-ed, and I think what Leslie Root was really getting at, was that we need to be more clear and concise about communicating our research. And one way to frame this kind of discussion is in the context of social media, where every tweet, <clears throat> excuse me, every tweet presents an opportunity for you to finesse your science communication skills. So um, 
an, like a, an important part of this is to take plenty of time to draft your tweets. Um, I usually take between five, 10, 15 minutes to draft and publish tweets. And sometimes I'll do different versions and I'll get into that a little bit later about the tools that I use. Um, but another really important part of this is to recognize that everyone who sees your tweet is not gonna be equipped with the language and scientific framework to understand complex processes if they are just simply stated. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the ways in which we can finesse that communication. So, great, okay. So before I think uh, anyone should really start their Twitter account, or maybe if you already have started it, this may be a, a good way to re reposition yourself, is to take into consideration these questions. Um, and so asking yourself, what is your voice? How do you want to use it? and who do you want to connect with? All of these questions can kind of lead you toward goals and outcomes and kind of put your professional Twitter account in a framework where you can really be more purposeful. Um, and I just wanna add in here about this third bullet point, does your institution have a social media guide? So some institutions have um, policies that might be relevant to dissemination. And so uh, it would be helpful, I think in some cases to review those policies, but also most in institutions have communication professionals that you could reach out to if you had any questions. And speaking as a <laughs> communications professional myself, I'm always happy to talk with people and help answer questions, but really also just have conversation and discussion because I think that's when I learn more uh, about my role, which is supporting research. And I think it's also just creates an open dialogue for all of us. Um, so this, these last two bullet points are pretty important. What do you wanna accomplish using your voice? Um, followers, hits to your websites, citations. These are all things that we kind of talked about in the context and climate um, part of this presentation. Um, but lastly, I think it's really important to consider what are the real world implications of your research. Twitter is not necessarily a silo. And so I think that some of us have experienced scientific silos in our career and in our work, but it's important to consider that this is a public platform where if you are getting that traffic and if you're accomplishing your goals, you also need to think like, what's the why here? Not just how did I do this, but why am I doing this? What impact does it have on our lives? And so that's just, you know, as a final takeaway. Um, also, just as a quick note, um, we were just talking about this before starting the webinar, but if you haven't yet created a Twitter account, it's important to consider um, using a professional photo, <laughs> um, if that's something that you're interested in. And also, um, when you create a Twitter account, you have to basically search as you're doing it for handles, your Twitter handle. And so using a Twitter handle that is an effective, recognizable um, you know, way for your colleagues to discover you, I think is also really important. I My old personal <laughs> Twitter handle was Shanooner Crane, and now I've changed it to something different. So just, just as an FYI, I think that if you're using Twitter in this kind of more professional context, it's important to consider what actually you look like in your photo and what your handle is. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about the fundamentals of Twitter content. Um, so really one of the most important things is be yourself, authenticity. We were just talking about how um, Twitter has, you know, 500 million tweets a day. There's almost 200 daily active users. 
people really don't want to see, um, you know, content that has been, uh, that it doesn't have kind of a personality on its own. Like you want to have your, you want to represent yourself as an individual on Twitter. Um, and developing your voice and followers takes time. <laughs> so we started um, a Twitter account for the Population Studies Center in 2016. And our growth um, has been slow. It's, it's not necessarily something that everyone should expect to happen, which is like this idea of going viral. Sorry, it's a bust. <laughs> um, but a lot of what we're gonna talk about today is developing organic followings and, and really putting that effort in to develop uh, Twitter relationships. And part of that is that no one really wants to hear about you all of the time. <laughs> Usually I recommend for people that are trying to build a Twitter following or a Twitter presence that their content should be about 70% their colleagues and other content that they find and share. And then about 30% your own work. You can go 60-40 on that or 50-50, but it should really not, it should be more um, collaborative. And I think the whole point of this is to just build community and you're doing that through engaging with other people's content. And so as a last point here, uh, Twitter has had different character limits over the years, but right now it's 280. And I think a really important part of this is to ask yourself, what does your post really mean? Um, so just you know, a minute ago, I was talking about why are you tweeting? What is the um, motivation behind sharing your, your thoughts and your work? Um, but another part of this is what does your tweet actually really mean? And I just wanted to add in here this de-jargonizer link. Um, it can be an interesting tool to use. I wouldn't say that it's um, full, fully, you know, vetted. I think it's a guide in some ways. But that's just a, as a side point. Cool. So now we're going to talk a little bit about um, tips. So the first tip is when it comes to Twitter, quality versus quantity is, um, I think, a really good and um, achievable standard to hold for yourself. So one thing that um, I'm sure we've all experienced at some point in our lives as an oversharer, someone who just, I got my Starbucks coffee today, tweet, <laughs> got new shoes, wearing them to the office, tweet. And some of those things can be really fun bits of your day, but it absolutely does not need to happen every hour of the day. And I think that people are really following you for your expertise as a population scientist. And granted, new shoes, cat pick, all of those things have their place. And I think it's totally okay to be yourself and be your individual. And, you know, all of our lives are also not just work and um, population science or demography or whatever your field is. So that's an important thing to take into consideration. Um, and I just also wanted to add here that each post should have or each tweet really should have one and only one ask. So I wanted to um, highlight a tweet here. Um, I think everyone, everyone should be able to see that pretty clearly, but essentially what this person is doing, it's just one tweet and they're just linking to their new article that they published. Um, this tweet has an image and then at the end, you can see that there's a thread. So one way that you can go beyond your 280 character limit is to create a Twitter thread. And I think what this really does is allows for each individual tweet to have a specific thought. And when you try and pack too much into one tweet, it can be really overwhelming and also really difficult to write and draft sometimes because you're trying to communicate too much in such a small space. So I think threads can be a really cool way for new publications, especially where you have 
you know, something that just came out, you want to talk about it, but there's different parts and levels to it, which there are in most articles. I understand that, but I think a thread would be great for that. And it also allows for more robust storytelling. Threads are not only just for um, sharing articles, but you can really tell a story using a Twitter thread. And that is something we see too. Cool, so our next better tweet tip <laughs> is to tag relevant accounts. So one, uh, one example that I wanted to raise today is a tweet from a colleague of mine who tweeted about their new article and linked it. But as you'll see, they tagged all of the kind of funders, publishers, and institutions that were involved with um, this article. And what this does is it can raise visibility for your tweet. So if you tag, um, Pop Associ America, PA, which we're all very familiar with, um, you might get a, a retweet or you might get people who are also tweeting about that. Um, and we'll also talk about hashtags in its slide too. But it also lets funders and centers know, I mean, every time that someone tags me, me being Penn PSC in an account, I get a notification. Um, and I'm always happy to retweet and share new research. So just as a, a level. Also, when you're tagging individuals um, or co-authors, like not um, institutional level accounts, it's definitely helpful to go search, go follow them, um, but make sure you're tagging the right person. And I will share some tools about how I double, triple check myself in doing that at the end of this too. Okay, so next we're just gonna talk about this slide, which I really, really, really love. An important part of using Twitter and being online and using social media to disseminate our visuals. And so not every point that you want to make necessarily needs to be said using all 280 characters. And sometimes it can just be one sentence with a really effective visual. Um, and uh, images and visuals can increase your engagement of your tweet by up to three times. And I think that this is something too that's becoming more relevant for um, when you're writing your article, like data visualization and kind of creating a graph that looks cool. I feel like some people in the back of their heads know that they can use that to disseminate and kind of pull in as like a visual hook. And that can be really useful sometimes. Um, yeah, so anyway, I just love this graphic. I just feel like it does, yeah, all the work of the tweet. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to quickly talk about hashtags. So I think maybe a few years ago, hashtags were like really popular and everyone was using hashtags in almost every tweet, which is, was very cool. I think that today it's a little, a little less so the case. Um, and generally um, I'd say two to three hashtags is like kind of the industry maximum. Otherwise, you're getting into this territory um, of this tweet where it's kind of visually hard to look at. Um, and yeah, <laughs> hashtags are essential to most tweets, but too many makes tweets unreadable. <laughs> um, so you'll see, I think, throughout, you know, exploring Twitter as a space for academics and for population science researchers, that there are certain hashtags that people use. Um, a lot of conferences use hashtags. And so when PAA happens next week, be sure to use, you know, hashtag PAA 2021. Um, and there are also just some fun, fun accounts too. I know that there was at our last in-person meeting a PAA alpaca kind of hashtag going around, which is, if you don't know, I highly recommend looking it up. Okay. So next, I just wanted to talk a little bit about emojis. So many of us kind of experience emojis as like crying and 
crying laughing faces in our text messages. Um, but emojis can be visual cues as well. And they can really add to um, the process of drafting the actual copy for the tweet. So in this example, we see this kind of like alarm siren thing and then the downwards arrow to um, signify decrease, but instead of using the word decrease, it's just an emoji. Um, so these are, I would encourage everyone to explore kind of some of the emojis. Obviously not all of them are gonna be relevant, <laughs> but I think that this could be a fun way to incorporate them in your content. Okay, so I just wanted to reiterate here on this slide that images matter. Um, again, they can increase your tweet engagement, but there are also lots of tools that you can use to create images. Um, uh, also, as a side note, GIFs can be another fun way to do that, or GIFs, GIFs, however you pronounce it. Um, but I like to use WordSwag, ImageQuote, and really Canva is my go-to. So for Canva, you can make a free account and basically they have templates that are the exact size graphic that you would need for Facebook posts, Instagram, Twitter, and you can really um, do a lot with that. So it's awesome. And also uh, your institution might have access to a photo or um, image library. And I would encourage everyone to go and look at all of those. They might not be as applicable to some of your work or research, but it's still kind of cool to see. Um, some institutions have like stock image licensing. Um, so they'll have um, some, a deal maybe where you can go and grab an image. Um, I wanted to quickly point out about link shorteners. So, I'm not sure exactly when Twitter started automatically shortening links, but they take a link and they shorten it to 23 characters. But you can always use bit.ly or tinyurl to shorten your links. Um, and I remember a few slides ago, I was talking about the tools that I use to draft my tweets. So I like to use Notepad and Word <laughs> in drafting my tweets. And I always like to have different um, kind of, I like to use the links and then also kind of do use all these different tools to make versions and then kind of pick out which, which is the version that I think is going to work best in the context. So, um, there's lots of different things that you can do with this. And also, I um, just want to clarify as a communications professional, I'm not tweeting directly about my, you know, um, constant urge to want to adopt a pet. <laughs> so I'm not tweeting about myself personally, but I am tweeting in support of other researchers. So I understand that where I'm coming from might be like 100% of a professional context, whereas I think that it's achievable to create a balance. I think we'll talk about that a little bit too in our um, panel discussion. Um, Lastly, I just wanted to let everyone know that if you have a Twitter account, you can use Twitter analytics. And again, this might be coming from me, but it can be really helpful to look at your tweets um, in a kind of back end review way. So you can look at all of your engagement with your likes, comments, and retweets. And you can also look at your reach. So if you kind of feel like you're tweeting into the abyss, but you're not really sure. Twitter analytics might be an interesting tool for you to see, you know, how many people actually saw this tweet. Um, and I just wanted to give this example of the PAA tweet uh, from this week about this webinar. <laughs> um, and I created that graphic using a um, Canva Twitter template. And so again, it's super easy. I highly recommend it. And they also have info infographic templates if that's something that people are interested in. Um, yeah, cool. All right, moving on. As a last note, I just wanted to say that there's no single formula for being good at Twitter and social media and developing relationships and 
being consistent in your voice and your goals are really, I think, the best way to um, have an online presence and develop one too. Um, so with that, I'll just say thank you to everyone here for joining and listening to me. And I really appreciate all of your attention. Um, so I know that I put questions here and I do see a few chats. So let me just look here. Okay. Okay, cool. I'm just gonna look at the Q&A real quick. Do you have best practices for accessibility on Twitter, like providing alt text for images? Yes, so providing alt text for images um, and making your content more accessible is definitely something that you can do. Um, maybe using a Twitter thread, given if you have like a statement and other characters, you can utilize that. But I actually have a colleague um, who is like an expert in accessibility online and not just on social media. So I will maybe in a follow-up um, point, uh, point to her because she's really an expert. Okay, so the second question says, for faculty, what are considerations to keep in mind in terms of frequency of tweets? What is too less? What is too more? Any insights? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And thank you both for those. Um, I think, you know, we will talk about this in the panel discussion. And really, I think it has to do with what you're comfortable with as an individual, and how much time per week you really feel like contributing to your Twitter page and to Twitter in general. Um, yeah, and actually with that, why don't I just stop sharing and we will move into our discussion. Cool, all right. So thank you all. And one second. Okay, so one of the things that Part of me email sounds. Oof. One of the things that always comes up for me in my um, job, and I think that one of the bigger questions for each of us that we should really ask ourselves is like, what is the benefit of me doing this? Why should I be on Twitter in the first place? Um, I think that there has been in the past few years a lot of like concerns about the Twitter algorithm and like more kind of national level discussions about what role social media plays in our access to information and data privacy and all these different issues, which I'm not, I think they're very important. And so as an individual, I think everyone should feel um, motivated to go look into that. Unfortunately, that's not what today's presentation is about, but I think it would be interesting to just start off this panel discussion with what what are some benefits that you've found from using Twitter as a population science and researcher? So yeah, you should just feel free to unmute yourself or just hop in. Oh, we're shy. I guess I'll hop in. <laughs> Since I unmuted first, I thought everyone was going to. Um, well, thanks for inviting me, Shannon, and for the presentation. Um, I'm really learning a lot too, because I, I am a really avid Twitter user, but I, I don't feel like I use it very strategically or have, um, you know, do it in, in deliberate ways all the time. So I'm happy to share my experiences, but I'm definitely not um, a guru in that sense. But what I've really, really enjoyed um, Twitter for has been connecting with the community of scholars, many of whom I've never met. And also what I've realized, especially using it a lot more during the pandemic is how many kind of early career scholars, especially, because I think it skews much younger than um, probably the rest of our discipline in general. And so for me, it's so exciting to see all the new work and all, um, that's coming out from the younger scholars, which often have great data visualizations. I'll give a little shout out to Ilya that I saw on the chat. Um, and 
I don't know. It's just, it makes me feel like I won't become a dinosaur because I will be in touch with the work that's coming out um, from younger cohorts. And so I really enjoy that. And then obviously this last year, we haven't been able to see each other. So, but I feel the connection um, by being interacting on, on Twitter. Um, and I'll just, I have a whole list of, of things, but another thing I just wanted to say that's been a benefit is real-time peer review for some things, you know, especially this year, people are putting preprints up there, you know, as quickly as possible, um, which I think has also been a boon that the work itself is just getting out very quickly. But um, my co-authors and I have had experiences where it's, it's really positive, you know, people might point out, and we, you know, if you make your um, code and everything freely available, people can point out some mistakes or they can push you on some of the conclusions and we've made very quick adaptations to the preprint based on feedback from Twitter. And I just, yeah, I find that really um, amazing and mostly positive. Obviously there's some negative aspects, which I think we are going to talk to, but um, I'm kind of an optimist. So I, I see the sunny side of Twitter and it's um, I think it's a great way to build community. Yeah, I can echo what Jen said. I'm also not a guru. And I think also my intention and goals with Twitter have evolved over time. So um, I think that's also, you know, I, start, I started my Twitter account when I was going on the academic job market as a way to sort of increase my visibility and hear about opportunities. And I think it's really changed over time. You know, for me, the probably the biggest benefit of Twitter is building a community of scholars who I might not otherwise meet, right? Like even thinking about Sarah, who she and I are both population health, you know, population scientists, but study different things. Um, but I have been able to follow and learn about Sarah's work in a way that um, I don't know would have happened even at a conference setting, right? Where we still tend to go to the same types of sessions and interact with the same silos of scholars. So that's been really, beneficial. I've, um, you know, some of the relationships built on via tw that started on Twitter have turned into collaborations, right, for me. And so I think that's been a huge benefit, especially, again, across sub-discipline lines or even across disciplinary lines. Um, and, you know, like Jen mentioned, for me, you know, aside from the network building, having an eye out for new scholarship that's relevant and important um, has been the other sort of biggest benefit. You know, sociology in particular, demography to some extent are kind of very slow moving publication machines. Um, the work tends not to get uh, turned around through the review process very quickly and, and put into print very quickly. But on Twitter, you know, you can read or hear about preprints um, in real time. You People often talk about projects that they're working on. And so you might even just have a sense of who people working on different topics are so you can reach out to them directly. Um, so for me, I think it's, it's sort of those two things, both the, the community building and networking part of things, but also just keeping on top of the latest research um, in the field, like Jen mentioned, I mean, I think that's become particularly true during the pandemic where the science is evolving hourly um, and staying on top of it. Twitter has somewhat helped with that. I don't have much new to add on top of those great answers. So for instance, I actually started my Twitter when I worked in a nonprofit before going back to grad school. And I very much used it to try to talk about the research we were doing there. And then it sort of shifted over time. But one of the other benefits I think of using Twitter and you sort of talked about academic chatter, I don't think I've ever used that, but I've other uh, kind of like hashtags or um, group chats that go on that make the process, I think a little less lonely, I would say. Um, Cause I think especially, you know, I'm a postdoc, so I'm sort of thinking about grad students and early career scholars. Uh, some of the processes, you know, like you shared the one from Courtney about how to do reviews and how to be kind in your reviews. Um, talking about those openly and talking about your own experiences, I think has, I can see how it can be a benefit to people to know, for instance, you know, um, that childcare is a big issue during COVID or that, you know, your life events that happen when you're on the market or things like that. Just these kind of like personal um, experiences that we can share with other people help build community and help make people feel less alone, which I think is an important aspect of using Twitter.
Yeah, I I just thank you all for your yeah very insightful and wonderful answers. I think I agree one hundred percent with you all. And one thing to to note in terms of you know our discussion and the presentation, um, and maybe I should have emphasized this a little more, but all of the all of the questions in that consideration slide will inevitably change over time. I think that as our careers and lives grow and in different ways, um, how we use Twitter as a platform will also grow and, and transition over time too. Um, I think it's also just like really cool that we're building community and like meeting each other for the first time in some instances. And yet we've been following each other on Twitter for like <laughs> months, if not years. And that's um, a really amazing um, experience. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. So we talked about um, community. I wanted to maybe address the question of challenges. And um, I think that there, I think that we could probably all pick out in our minds a few Twitter accounts who, of individuals who shall be named unnamed, <laughs> um, but who kind of take on the challenges and feedback that might not be so positive in like a very head on way. Um, and I guess I'm just curious what your experiences have been in addressing or not addressing people with feedback that is not constructive or maybe just not feedback at all and just commentary. And as I said, you know, Twitter is a platform of thoughts and ideas and comments. It's not necessarily all, um, you know, within the bounds of constructive and positive. Um, so I'm just wondering if one of you or either, each of you has an experience with that and how you've handled it. Um, you know, that, that also is just, it's something I think is universal um, in having a Twitter account and being, you're just being a scientist in general. <laughs> um, and yeah, I'll just leave it at that. I think this is a really hard one um, and also something that I, I think I'm getting better over time. Um, you know, I think when you share your research, I mean, the goal of doing research hopefully is that other people are gonna read and engage with it, right? And, um, and similar with your ideas that sort of derive from that research agenda. Um, I also think though that not everybody is well-intentioned with some of their thoughts and critiques and comments to you. And I think, um, I think the risks and rewards of this can also benefit drastically based on where people are within various systems of inequality, right? And so for people that are junior scholars, female scholars, um, scholars of color, um, sort of all these dimensions of inequality can open you up in ways that um, feel really challenging and risky and at sometimes threatening, right? And so I think that's important to just acknowledge upfront if you have a public account, especially, um, you know, I, my research is on largely on, um, on, the, on the links between racism and population health. And when tweets get picked up, um, it is frequent that, you know, sometimes you have folks who uh, are, again, not well-intentioned, not really trying to learn or engage with the, with the content, um, but really trying to make political points that can frequently be racist. Um, and so for me, you know, a couple of things that I've learned along the way is that, number one, I don't have to respond to anybody. Um, I don't owe anybody my time, my attention, my frustration. Um, and so I can block people and I've gotten much quicker at that <laughs> recently. Um, when I tweet something, um, I can uh, restrict who is able to comment on it. And I often do that for, for work that I think um, might uh, sort of bring about some of these more unpleasant uh, reactions. Um, and I can also just ignore things, right? And I think when I was first starting out, I felt like any time I got a notification that someone had commented on a post of mine, um, I felt the need to respond to it. 
And that quickly turns bad because you realize um, that not everyone is there to learn um, or to engage in a, a civil uh, scholarly conversation, right? And so, so for me, that's, that, those have been a couple of strategies is, is like recognizing that I can set boundaries and hold, my, you know, hold those boundaries firmly. Um, and then there are, again, these sort of Twitter tools like restricting who can uh, comment um, and, and blocking folks or, or deleting um, folks that that you think are just sort of toxic uh, individuals um, but this you know I think it's a real challenge especially if you are tweeting about um, issues that have political relevance which you know hopefully most population researchers are doing I really agree with everything Courtney said it also um, took me a while to to realize that you don't have to respond to everyone um, I mean, it's almost impossible to do that, but it takes a lot of emotional energy, you know, in a lot of cases. And it does seem since we're putting stuff out there that, you know, you want to engage with people, but um, I agree that setting the boundaries and no one is entitled to your time, you know, to explain things further to them. So, um, but that was something that took a while to learn and a very similar story. I, I mean, I will say overall, I do not experience much negative interactions on Twitter and I, it might be my topics are not as, as um, controversial or I know there's certain topics where the trolls are kind of looking for, for trouble. So I think in some respects, a lot of um, you know, academic Twitter can stay under the radar um, of trolls, but especially with COVID going on, there's been Thing, you know, a lot of things have gotten politicized that you wouldn't have expected to be. And I, so it was, I, I agree that not everyone is there to have an earnest discussion. And again, I'm just kind of, I think the best of people, I assume the best of people from the beginning. So I did um, get sucked into some discussions where I was trying to genuinely have an academic debate. And it took me just a while to learn and realize that these people were not interested in that. And um, you know, that I shouldn't actually let them use me to, you know, to further that, you know, because some of them are like, oh, look, I'm having this nice discussion, um, you know, trying to promote the fact that, that I was engaging with them. And um, obviously, that's, that's not always what you want. So, um, you know, so I am having to, to lose some naivete that everyone out there has good intentions for discussion. Um, and I would just um, reiterate the point about uh, it'd be interesting to hear more how junior scholars feel because I was going to put as one of my positives about um, about Twitter that I feel like junior scholars have a good voice. Like from from my perspective, I I really love you know following um, younger scholars and I think of them as complete colleagues and peers on Twitter. But there have been some instances, and Ilya ha has been part of some some really kind of attacks on younger scholars and denigrating their credentials because they're still PhD students or something um, from much, from very senior and kind of well-known people. And I think that's a real shame and we should all defend, um, defend the junior scholars when we see that happening. But there is, yeah, there's, there's not all good stuff that happens, but I agree you can, you know, use block and use mute and don't feel bad about it at all. Um, and, you know, yeah, use it, use it to promote your own voice and not, not worry about every, <laughs> every other person out there. I don't have much to add on top of all of that. I think um, there's the saying that you pay the trolls with your time and so you shouldn't. Um, and uh, so I think that that's usually the, the, you know, process that I take for myself. Um, but I did want to talk about snitch tagging because that comes up in the, the negative sort of side of Twitter um, in terms of if people are attacking someone, you really, it's not recommended to then tag them so that they see it. Um, I think the sentiment that I've seen across Twitter is that please don't do that to me. I don't need to know that more people are bad mouthing me or saying something negative. Um, I think, you know, instead reaching out and supporting that person um, or like Jen says, or just supporting them on Twitter in the conversation instead of pointing that kind of gossip and bad mouthing out to them by tagging them. I've never heard of snitch tagging. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, that does not 
um, sound like the most uplifting practice. <laughs> hey, look what someone said about you. Um, I think, you know, I, I really appreciate all of your experiences. And I think there's something really to be said um, and noted, which is that in each of your responses, I think that there's kind of this question of what does allyship and like, what does it mean to follow someone on Twitter that you have built this community with, but then also witnessing that. And as much as tweets and um, sharing is really like effective sometimes, uh, Twitter has um, DMs. And I think one thing that I've experienced in my personal life and on, in my non-professional Twitter is um, not necessarily rushing to comment on someone's, you know, um, harsh tweet but more rushing to slide into that person's DMs and say, hey, I don't know if you like know, but you don't need to like look at that and I'm here to support you and like give me a call if you need anything. Um, and I think that it kind of transforms. So like online community is one thing, but when you're dealing with kind of very emotional and harsh and difficult situations around sometimes not even your research directly, um, depending on your level of comfortability with that person, I think it's very acceptable to just shoot them a quick message and say, hey, I'm here for you. Like, I'm here if you wanna talk. Um, and that doesn't even necessarily mean, like, I know the answer to solving this question <laughs> or this problem. Um, and I, I think that there's a lot more work to be done in terms of allyship in general, but um, it is also just, I want to say to each of you, I'm, I feel like upset and motivated to address like issues of racism and hate online. And I feel, although that wasn't really a part of my presentation, that it's something that all of us need to work better on. And I, just the idea of a junior scholar um, being kind of targeted by people who are well into their careers and with, you know, not the best intentions or not well intentioned at all is very upsetting. Um, and I think that the other side of that too is that, you know, Twitter also has allowed us to build this community where you know, in some research centers, you're only there with a few other postdocs. But if you're in a community online of like hundreds of postdocs and you're all sharing about your experiences, it does, back to your point, Sarah, you know, make things feel a little less isolated. Um, yeah, I just, wow. Maybe if anyone in the audience has any thoughts about this too, please feel free to chime in because I feel like it's, um, something that's important. And even if you don't necessarily have like an answer, you know, feel free. Also for anyone in the audience, um, I have the ability to unmute you. So I won't be able to turn your video on, but if you wanted to add or ask a question, I can unmute you and you can chime in using your own voice. So feel free to just like shoot a chat or something if you'd like to participate audio wise. Um, so I think, you know, moving on from that, uh, you know, kind of in the same lane, I'd be curious to know over time what your experience has been in your investment in Twitter and how you've kind of like started maybe where you were when you had a, a moment of change and then kind of where you are now and, and really kind of what you've seen over time with not just time invested over the week, but um, getting to know just like using the app. I think there are some boundaries with people who don't really use social media that much, but it's not because they, for any specific or particular reason, but just because they don't. Um, and so getting used to being online and sharing can be a little challenging sometimes. So I'm just curious if 
over time you've seen any changes in yourself and your output. And I know we hinted on that a little bit earlier, but yeah, if you'd like to speak to that. And I think, yeah, I was just going to follow up from the, before we move on, uh, Marina yeah. said in, in the comments that in addition mm -hmm. to snitch tagging, being careful about who you tag, do they want to ask yourself, basically, do they want to be a part of that conversation? You know, what are you getting them into and exposing them to? I think that's a, that's a good point to make. Yeah, definitely. I think that, you know, for most cases, like tagging your co-author in a new article announcement is like a totally fine thing to do. But yeah, I mean, if you're um, engaging in a conversation that might feel like it might get a little tricky, <laughs> it's definitely good to, you know, have those conversations with people not publicly. Um, and yeah, thank you. That's a really wonderful point to make. I actually didn't even um, really consider that when I was putting my slides together, but it does make sense to consider who you're looping in and who you're tagging. So thank you. Okay, let me just another um, from, sorry, hold on. I gotta expand the chat window real quick. Um, yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Um, all right, so yeah, maybe we could just talk about a little a little bit about your experiences over time. And then maybe we will wrap up our panel discussion and move into Q&A and um, maybe we'll, we'll finalize it with a success or maybe a nugget of wisdom that you've, you've found or heard from someone else over your, over your Twitter careers. <laughs> In terms of time, I just wanted to, to point to something that you had mentioned earlier, Shannon, is that there's a lot of startup costs um, so I definitely spend a lot less time than I did, um, even if it seems like I spend a lot of time on Twitter, uh, because the startup costs are so high. Like you do have to follow people and engage with tweets and tweet yourself and, and get that sort of built up. And so I would say that it's natural for you to have to spend quite a bit of time up front. Uh, and then it sort of tapers off because then the, the machine starts doing it for you basically. Um, but in terms of that as well, as I think, and you also pointed this in your presentation to be authentic to yourself, I think you should um, do only what's a natural extension of you. Um, it's kind of like, I don't know if anybody's been watching the circle though, different people have different strategies, right? Like some people are real into just being who they are on social media and some people um, want to be somebody else. So I think you just have to think about that for yourself. But I, for me, it's most, it's easiest to use if it's just sort of an extension of things I would do naturally. I think that's true. Um, I, I don't know, I looked to see when I joined because you had put that question down and it was actually 2008, but I don't remember like using it really until practically when COVID, uh, you know, really dawned is when I, I started using it in earnest. So um, I'm trying to think of tips because I think, I think my natural instinct is to be a very passive Twitter consumer and, you know, to retweet things that I find are really interesting, but so one thing that I don't think I'm particularly good at, but I have realized is something that we probably, if you want to become, um, you know, a bigger voice on Twitter, I think finding some value added, even if it's a simple retweet that you just put a couple lines of why you found this article particularly useful. Um, it's something I struggle to do because I'm laying in bed and I just want to retweet the, you know, the article. But I think if you're making a conscious effort to build a following or have a little bit more interaction, then, you know, a little bit of value added, even for just retweets or sharing um, material. And then, you know, it took me, I think, only this past year to try making threads for, for particular work and the threads are really effective at, um, I, I think, at least for me, they're the things that are most, um, get the most reach and, and retweets. And I guess it's not surprising, but it, and I really do like what you said, Shannon, that it kind of makes you hone your science communication in these short little bits. Like you really have to summarize um, the most important parts. Um, I like adding visualizations either from the paper or GIFs. Like I think, 
that works really well in threads. Um, but it's, um, it's so much, and as a consumer, I really appreciate people taking the time to explain a paper and a thread instead of just throwing me the, yeah, the link to the paper. Um, so I try to reciprocate, but it is a lot of effort to make, it is a lot of effort to make a thread. They look so short, but, um, it, you know, it does take some practice and effort, but I think it's a real contribution, especially interpreting your own work for people. So, um, it's worth a little bit of effort instead of just passively retweeting things. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, I think, um, I, it, my Twitter use has also evolved and pick up in the pandemic, both because of content and because of just like, I'm home all the time <laughs> and have nothing to do. And so I do scroll through Twitter occasionally. Um, and I think, you know, one thing that I've tried to be, and I think Shannon, you talked a little bit about this, but try to be intentional about is um, the types of tweets that I send. So in addition to retweeting content that I think is important, sometimes highlighting why I think it's important or just, or not just retweeting it. Um, you know, for me, that's a really useful part of Twitter. It's how I learn about a lot of papers, um, sharing some of my own work, um, as well as just, you know, critical reflections on topics that I'm thinking about, right? And so, you know, when I think about some of the tweets that probably have received the most engagement um, of mine have been really sort of trying to synthesize my, my ideas and thinking about particular topics um, and where I want to see the field move or things that I'm grappling with in my own work that I want to hear other people's thoughts about, right? And so I think that's um, another, it has been really valuable um, for me. Um, the other thing that I think, I'm not also a big social media user outside of Twitter. And part of that is that I'm a relatively private person. And, and so I think um, people should feel free or not to share as much or as little um, of their personal lives as, as they want um, and of themselves, right? And so, you know, this is where, I, you know, I'm very mindful too, you know, I have two kids under five and during the pandemic have been working from home without childcare. And so sometimes sharing that as a professionalization, like, you know, acknowledging the challenges of that, while also not tweeting about my kids really, but but I think, you know, this is something that people have to ask themselves what their comfort levels are. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's interesting, Jen, I, you know, when I was thinking about the junior scholars, I've, I've seen this sort of like piling on attack of junior scholars credentials or work in a way that's totally unprofessional. You know, another consideration that I also have is, you know, sometimes people can get the impression, like the impression that they know you. Um, via your online presence, right? And so, you know, I'm mindful of the bias that can happen when you tweet a lot about your kids or your partner or um, parts of your personal life that then people have an impression of you um, that's not uh, what they might get otherwise if it wasn't for Twitter, right? And so those are, those are things that I think everyone has to decide for themselves um, what the benefits and limitations are. But, you know, I think, you know, as I've used Twitter, I, I try to keep um, somewhat regularly engaged too, because I think this is, um, that's how you build the community, right? If you're never tweeting and jump on every once in a while, it can feel overwhelming and you kind of lose sense of why you joined in the, um, uh, in the first place. And so I try to at least tweet out one original tweet, you know, every few days in addition to sort of liking or retweeting other content. Yeah, definitely. I just want to second everything you guys said, because I, I think that there's really something valuable um, in, well, there, there's inherent value in um, social media being an extension of our reality, <laughs> right? Like, that's, I feel like there's a lot of um, discussion in general, not just a, in, you know, um, a scientific context, but how our lives are presented on social media versus real life. And I think that, you know, your comment about privacy is really, is really true. And it really should, every person should consider what level they're comfortable with. Um, and sometimes that's trial and error. Like not every experience you have is going to be a perfect culmination of your ideas and then how other people engage and interact with it. Um, but I, I do think that consistency with whatever levels you're comfortable with really can help with 
um, getting over those starting costs, as Sarah said, um, and really engaging with the people that you support and that you um, appreciate and value in both a scientific and in like a social way um, can be really beneficial. Um, yeah, I think that there's there's a lot of nuance, <laughs> obviously, right? Like it's not just, oh, hey, you can send a tweet, tag this person, you're good to go. Um, but I really appreciate all of your, all three of your thoughts and feedback about this because, you know, what it really is at the end of the day is it's all of us learning how to engage in this. And I think in the past year, since we've all been online for, I'll say most of my day, <laughs> um, it can be really hard sometimes to not only like engage in a positive way, but also, you know, there's all this research now about how being on social media for, you know, extended periods of time can be really bad for your mental health. And I will just um, encourage everyone to um, tweet with your own level of comfortability, but then also take time to step away and like go outside, be with your family. It, not all of the, you know, social interactions of our lives are online and certainly not on Twitter. Um, and I think, you know, with each of your contributions, there are definitely some other questions that have come up. Like, how how do you handle situations where there's harsh, ill, in, Ill intention, you know, criticism, not even criticism, maybe just like not niceties. <laughs> I don't know how to say this in like a, you know, my personal way, but how, how would we deal with someone who's well, you know, well tenured in their career and being mean to early career scholars? Like, I think, you know, on one hand, we're all online, but if you're not a Twitter bot, people are going to recognize and see that. And if you in general are stirring up some hate or other types of, you know, just like harsh, I'm just gonna use the word harsh, harsh uh, dialogues or tones. I think that people recognize that and, you know, I'm not really sure how that plays out in real life. If I saw, if I saw someone being uh, not a nice or good person online, I probably would maybe consider not really talking to them in person if I saw them at a conference. Or I would come up with some other way to, <laughs> to like address them about it. But it's really unclear. And I think this is part of the nuance of like, we're all in this kind of community, but not everyone is, I think, understanding of what that community means and what the future of the community looks like. I think that there are a lot of PhD students and early career scholars who are just really doing their absolute ultimate best. And at every step of the way, I think we should just be embracing all of that experience, good and bad, um, and not bad with the this person who, I don't know who they are, but <laughs> I would not be happy about that. Um, Anyway, I'll just um, leave it at that. And I'll also just say that uh, I really appreciate all of your time. And I think that the most important thing that I've learned is just speaking to my colleagues and friends and individuals about their experiences. And that's where I've learned the most. Um, you know, I can read a hundred blogs and still not really get a full sense of what it means to be on Twitter. Um, and I think when we open ourselves up to communication with others, that's where that community piece and feeling connected really begins. Um, so with that, uh, again, once more, thank you again. Um, I see we have some chats. We'll move into a little bit of Q&A um, here. So anyone, please feel free to unmute yourselves um, or wait. You can't unmute yourselves. I'll unmute you, but chat and tell me you want to be unmuted. Um, 
did want to say real quick on yeah. the startup costs, uh, mm -hmm. conferences, PAA, for instance, are a great way to to spend all of your startup costs at once because everybody else will be interacting with the hashtags and in different posts. And so you'll be able to find people extremely quickly that way. Um, and so I just wanted to give that as a tip. If you're thinking of starting up, conference time is like the best time to do it. Yeah, definitely. I'll just add to that. Um, Sarah and I have been on the PAA social media team for a few years now. And one way that um, we have in the past and hopefully will again in the future gain some, uh, I guess, interest in social media and Twitter and PAA is through this um, being a PAA volunteer. And so at past meetings, what we did was it was, you know, a group of us, mostly postdocs and early career scholars and PhD students who would all get together throughout the conference and tweet, um, you know, about just like, you know, a cool session, something that you saw that was interesting. And then we would meet up in real life and like grab coffee or just sit down and have a, a quick convo. And it's it's not always like perfect or ideal. <laughs> I think in, in Austin, we were like sitting at a Starbucks coffee table where we were all kind of like together. But yeah, I think again, Sarah, to your point, there's real value in if you are able to attend the conferences, then following up on all of that afterwards on Twitter can be a really easy way to gain some following and also follow like, more and new people that might not even, you know, be in your specific field. But I think that's kind of what PAA does for a lot of people is it's this opportunity to attend and listen about to research about, you know, any number of different things. Um, and I think there's a lot of value in that too. Okay. I asked Ilya if he wanted to be unmuted, but he didn't answer me. So we'll just go with that. <laughs> um, he did, however, ask a question um, about um, defining your alt metric score on Twitter. Um, and alt metric is being used more and more in research evaluation. Yes, this is true. This basically assumes that attention is necessarily positive. It's not always the case. For example, three papers from top 20 noticed in 2020 were already retracted. So the first question is, um, should you link, if you have a, a bad critique of your paper, should you link the paper in your first tweet or link it later on? Oh, all good. <laughs> um, thank you for that question. That was really interesting. Um, you know, I think that to be fully, Transparent, I'm not entirely sure of the ways in which like tweets and alt metrics and links um, to articles all kind of correspond. And I'm sure that <clears throat> like over time this will change too, because I totally hear you and understand that like not every criticism, not every tweet and retweet of your article Hopefully most of them are positive, but not everyone is gonna be positive. You know, it's kind of what we just talked about, but I can look into that a little bit more. I'm not entirely sure of what that relationship will be and, you know, drilling down on um, using alt metric scores in a, in a more, I guess, in a, in a specific framework type of way. Like, I, I think, think um, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I think um, maybe what Ilya was saying is that he doesn't want to contribute to the metrics of these bad papers that are being critiqued. And I think it does come up also with tweets that you sometimes people will just take a, a screenshot then of a tweet that they're criticizing so that they're not continuing to amplify it with a retweet that can continue to get retweeted. I don't know. So I'm not an expert on that either, but I think there are strategies if you're trying to point something out that's negative, but not give it too much credit in its, its own metrics, you can maybe take a screenshot um, 
as one one suggestion or I because it, it is frustrating when people are alluding to something that they don't want to link to and you're trying to figure it out. Um, so, yeah, it's good to give people at least some hints of what you're critiquing, I think. Yeah, definitely. I completely misread the question. <laughs> I, th- I, I think apologize that. for that. Um, <laughs> I was like, oh, I don't know how Altmetric calculates all those subtweets. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think that's a good question. I know personally um, and with, you know, kind of from my more professional framework of um, using and managing social media, um, basically it's kind of part of my job not really to critique that much. And so in general, Um, you know, I think that there was earlier, someone mentioned, I think Courtney, you mentioned this idea of like, um, positive criticism or constructive criticism. That's just like, you know, Hey, I saw this data set. Maybe we could fix. Oh, actually, Jen, it was you. I'm sorry. You were talking about like the different kind of levels and small, like kind of nuggets of constructive criticism that come through sometimes. And, Again, I think this is a personal choice, but uh, if you're wanting to critique something um, in a way that isn't constructive or, you know, in a way that potentially does land you in that kind of gray area of feedback that you may or may not receive, um, not, not drawing attention to the actual article. I'm, you could do a screenshot. I know that some people have like, use the asterisk to not um, have full words um, like searchable. Um, And so that would be, I guess, another way. But yeah, I'm not really sure how I, I don't think I've personally had that experience in my professional career, but I do know that sometimes people will use, you know, also you can just block words um, and phrases out of your Twitter. So if you're like, I don't want to ever see a tweet that says Donald Trump Jr., you can just (laughs) block that out. Um, And there are some ways where, you know, if you're not giving the criticism or, you know, contributing to that type of conversation, you can at least um, not see it for the most part, I think, in some ways. I think that's also changing too, because the way that people are navigating these different situations really depends on where you're coming from. So as like scientists and researchers, I think that, you know, there's a lot less like want to go ahead and jump in and just like fire off a few tweets. But I think for some people that they're, if that is their MO, then there's other kind of more technical ways to get around driving that traffic. Um, Okay, so we have a few more tweets. Um, Right, okay. So Marissa again is saying about um, alt metrics. And, you know, it's interesting because some universities are considering not necessarily alt metric scores, but what alt metrics, I think that in some ways alt metrics is, allows for us to really trace between Twitter and news back to the article. But, um, you know, that score in of itself, I'm not really sure how many institutions are utilizing that. Um, But I do think that it can be helpful in some ways. And in general, it allows now for researchers as individuals to have a published piece of work or even, you know, um, a preprint and link it back. So, you know, I think that there's definitely also going to be pluses and minuses with that. And we'll see what happens. So, um, you know, I, I don't know. And if you have any further thoughts on that, let me know. <laughs> um, and feel I can unmute you if you're interested. Um, do either, do any of you have any thoughts on alt metrics as a, uh, I should probably put on my librarian hat at this point, <laughs> but I feel like we only have a like seven-ish minutes left. Um, 
Okay. I don't have all, met all metrics or however you say it, um, but I did want to talk about the accessibility thing really briefly. Mm, yeah. Um, so I think the thing to keep in mind is just thinking about the different ways that your um, tweets might be read in terms of like if people are using screen readers, um, if they're visually impaired, right? Um, so Twitter for a minute, uh, I don't think I even ever used this, came out with like voice memos or voice tweets. And the problem with that is that like, some people can only read the screen. And so that makes it unaccessible. And so the ways that you can, or the ways that at least I know of, of making tweets more accessible is using the alt text, uh, which pops up whenever you put a picture in. But I've also seen people type out the caption, either if they have space in that same tweet, if not like in a, in a thread underneath. Um, and, and using capitalized letters in terms of hashtags. Um, there was an example, I think you can even look it up online where they had a screen reader read, you know, like a sentence that was hashtagged and it just is like, it d doesn't make any sense. Um, so screen readers rely on capitalized letters to, to be able to read those. Um, but I think that those are just a few of the ones um, that I think Twitter is making, you know, like whenever I upload a picture, it automatically asks me for alt text. And so I think utilizing that um, is important. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think in general, um, social media is uh, adapting to more accessible standards has been a really slow process. <laughs> but I think more people are utilizing um, alt text, which is wonderful. And thank you for that point about the capital letters. Um, I will reach out to my colleague. I'm pretty sure that they made a like a guide, an accessibility guide. It might not be Twitter specific, but I'm pretty sure that they did make an accessibility guide for like social media posts. And I can share that um, after the fact. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, so Ilya is saying for not Twitter specific, but for data visualization um, to try not to use green and red palettes um, for the potentially colorblind. Um, and that's another interesting note. I think that, um, yeah, also colors do show up differently on different screens. Thank you again. You both are contributing so much. I feel like I should just, let's have you all in the panel. Um, uh, yeah, my whenever I design graphics for my job throughout the day, I'm always like testing it on my colleagues' different screens. Sometimes it's purple, sometimes it's just blue or gray. <laughs> um, so it really does depend. Um, and thank you both for those points. Um, so we just have uh, four four more minutes, and I just wanted to. Um, Marissa brought up this, this point of, um, this might be more than we, we can fit into four minutes, but Marissa brought up this point about um, social science and genetics work and how to um, communicate and engage with that work, but explicitly kind of remove yourself from the conversation of eugenics. Um, and this is really interesting because I feel like it's come up a little bit too, and I support some researchers who are doing um, gen more genetic focused work. Um, and, you know, I really think that at the core of it, it might seem a little counterintuitive, but for someone that's doing work that could be interpreted in many different ways, actually having like a short video or content that isn't just a tweet to explain and, and really like communicate what it is that their research means exactly and for what purposes it is can be really useful, just especially about topics that can be really taken out of context. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I don't know if any of you have experienced this like you know, kind of push for communications to go beyond a tweet. If you're ever in a situation where you're like, I wish I could just like have a five minute video about this, <laughs> like what can I do? Um, and that's something in my job that we're trying to 
support more and gain more interest in for people to write, you know, blogs where you have more space to really break down what it is um, or, you know, short videos. Um, but again, that goes like beyond the scope of Twitter. Um, but yeah, I'm just curious, do any of you have any experience with something like that? It's not about this issue specifically, but it's to say that I think one of the challenges of Twitter is that a lot of the engagement is relatively superficial, right? And so I think have, going in with that mindset that most folks who see the tweet aren't going to read the paper. Um, and, and so for papers that I've had that have been much more complicated, sometimes I'll just say, here's a link to my latest paper <laughs> without providing a ton of um, sort of synthesis of some of the, the main findings. Because I, as you say, Shannon, I mean, I think working on other platforms, writing a blog post, infographs sometimes um, can be much more useful in terms of dissemination. Because it, it, I, it, that's to say I don't have a good solution, but I think acknowledging that a lot of engagement is very superficial and most folks are not gonna read the paper um, is a good way to sort of start thinking about before you go uh, and, and tweet about some work that, that you think could be misinterpreted. But one of my colleagues works in sociogenomics, so I don't know if it was because of this, but some of the journals are starting to do little short videos. Like mm -hmm. I think it was Nature or what you know, one of those Nature Genetics um, to summarize a paper that's coming out, like or a short little interview with the author. So um, I do think mixing up the content, um, you know, in different forms of science communication could be really nice. Um, and yeah, in the chat also, Ilya mentioned that photos, um, so whether it's a figure or just something you're uploading also allows you to tag a bunch of people, um, which is nice. Um, so yeah, I do think it's, we can't ask people for to get too much nuance from a single tweet, um, but I think we should try, try some new modes of, of science communication. Why not? <laughs> Yeah, definitely. No, I, yeah, thank you for both of your um, answers with that. Yeah, I think it's, there's, as you said, I think that there's going to be some new innovations, however small they are, to include more people. And um, in terms of science communication, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure that most universities, whether they might not have um, a person dedicated to each like school or center, but um, you know, I would encourage you all to, if you have a paper or product or product project that you feel like maybe you want to lend more attention to, reach out to your communication person and see if they're interested in doing like a little a short article. Um, Cause most of those people are really happy to get the ask. Um, and I think it just also helps build those relationships with the professionals at universities and, you know, whatever the institution is to help support your work too. Um, you know, myself and my colleagues are always looking for new and different ways that we can help our researchers and support our researchers. So it's, you're definitely not in um, a silo in terms of looking for new ways to do and communicate about things. Um, so we are two minutes over. My, my apologies. I see that some people are leaving. Thank you all for joining again. There is actually just one more question that I wanted to address in um, the Q&A from Preeti. So doesn't matter if you follow more than your followers. I am more for learning than how many followers, but externally, I wonder if institutions are using this for promotions or on for your rep reputation. So um, I just think this is an important question because I feel like there's sometimes a misnomer about this, that if you follow less people than you're followed by, it's some kind of like, ooh, like, I'm very popular and I'm only gonna follow these, like this group of people. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and that might be true for like celebrities, but I think in the context of population science and early career scholars, uh, especially if you're in that, that um, you know, 
starting range, those starting costs, I think that you should follow the people that you want to engage with and are interested in or have met or they're in your field. And what, you know, I wouldn't necessarily worry about that ratio too much. I don't really think it holds that much weight. And I don't think that people or universities are really considering, oh, you know, I follow like 500 people, but I'm only followed by 16 or something. You know, I obviously that's a really wide ratio. That would be like, oh, well, what are your tweets look like? Um, but I, I wouldn't um, pay too much mind to having those people out or, and I really, I don't think any tenure and promotion would care how many Twitter followers you have. So yeah. they might hold it against you for spending too much time on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think that that's just something that um, it does come up though. People kind of feel like there is this kind of social currency with followers. But again, I mean, I don't think any of us here are really, um, we're not really selling anything. <laughs> um, and so really at the end of the day, it's just um, spreading spreading your work and putting it in front of people who might be interested in it. Um, Shannon, I just wanted to follow up real quick on the thing yeah. we were talking about before, before we go um, uh -huh. in terms of uh, reaching out to like the media um, at your mm. university, but also like you were saying, you run the pen one, or the, you know, the pen pop one and um, Twitter. And I think that that's important. I, I always sort of uh, my ana best analogy is like on the first day of class, it's easier for all of your students to remember your name than for you to remember all of their names at first. And I, um, I feel that way with um, sort of section Twitters or organizational Twitters um, is that, you know, they see a lot of different things and they might ne not necessarily see your work. So if you can tag them, uh, they will see it. Like you mentioned, you get notifications of those. Uh, and I just think that that's a way to sort of help them find you. And then it is easier for them to find you later as well. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for that, Sarah. And, you know, for all who are left, I think that there, I know for a fact that each of your administrators of the POP centers um, are interested in, um, there's, I think, an ongoing conversation for organizations and institutions to um, add more support for things like this and for science communication. And also in that, you know, we are all learning as well. Um, and yeah, I think 100%, if you're in a center, go follow them. If you're a research associate being supported by a center, um, yeah, I think it'll, I think that would be an awesome resource and a good place to start. Awesome. Okay, Whew. we're six minutes over. It's totally fine. Um, thank you so much, um, Sarah and Courtney and Jennifer. And for all of you left in the room, I really appreciate it. And um, I will follow up with the accessibility kind of guide. And um, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. I'm just gonna put my email in the chat very fast. And yeah, also I just wanna say a quick shout out to Betsy who is the PAA communications director and manager. And so thank you again. I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon and enjoy the rest of your week. And we'll see you next week at PAA. We'll be, we'll be tweeting. Thank you. Thanks, Shannon. Bye. Bye, thanks.